Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Freedom Solutions DAO, and today we're going to talk about how to create a rational argument. So let's get started. So what is reason? What is rational? What is logic? What are the differences? So to start, we're going to quickly define them, and then we're going to go into the methodologies and uh, come back in more detail on reason versus logic towards the end. But let's get started with the definitions. So first off, reason is defined as a cause, an explanation, or justification for an action or event. Its second definition is the power of the mind to think and to understand and to form judgments by the process of logic. Its verb is to think, to understand, and form judgments by a process of logic. So the rational uh, definition is based on or in accordance with reason or logic. So again, rational is really focused on uh, being a superset of either reason or logic. And then, of course, the human's brain's ability to reason is, is even a more generalization uh, that's that that you would think of as a hierarchy. So so reason is our capability and our ability uh, of our mind to process information in an orderly way. Uh, rational is a, is using this capability to solely focus on either using reasoning or logic and not emotion. And logic is then defined as reasoning conducted or assessed in accordance with strict principles of validity. In this case, validity is like evidence, facts, um, using some form of methodology, which we'll get into, to test your reasoning or test your logic, right? So reasoning is really um, the ability of our brain to recognize consistent patterns. And this creates what we call facts. And these consistent patterns are things that are universal and consistent. So they have to be constant and they have to be universal in order to be a fact. Otherwise, they're either something that's a theory because we haven't proved it, or it's a hypothesis, which is really an idea without a lot of evidence, right? Um, or, or no evidence, ideally. And, um, and so in these, in these transitionary states, they're not facts, right? So in order to ensure we have a fact, it must be constant and it must be universal across whatever you're testing it against, right? So just keep those things in mind and we'll go into more depth as we go along. Reasoning is, of course, the process thereof. So, um, you know, using reasoning as, as a term, of course, encapsulates uh, using logic, which is, again, always correct and factual. Uh, so it, it's always consistent so it can always be tested it's always repeatable so like if we test it today and we test it tomorrow uh, with the same tests it will remain true if we test it in the worst case scenario the best case scenario it'll remain true that's that's how that's what logic is right that's the methodology of logic um where ambiguity exists we use reason some people call uh that to some degree a hunch maybe you know or some sort of experiential uh, intuition where, you know, based on previous knowledge that we've had stored in either a cognitive brain or subconscious brain, that uh, we're going to come up with really quick analysis and, and you know, perhaps take a course of action or come to a conclusion. Uh, generally, reason is, is used when there's a lack of evidence or lack of time to do a full analysis. And we'll get into the, the demarcations uh, as we go along, you know, versus logic versus reason. Okay. So what's really important here? <laughs> Argument structure. So there is an entire history in the, and certainly in the, in the last, I'd say, uh, 20, maybe 40 years of, of arguments that aren't really arguments. We um, used to, in our education system, uh, force these structural concepts of, of arguments in all of our teachings in the way that we would do debates in class and the way that, um, you know, children were instructed. And, and that's just disappeared. Um, lots of reasons. We'll go into another show. But basically, uh, today, very few people actually create an argument. Uh, very few people 
created homonyms or they just uh, blur out shit that you know, makes no sense, right? And so um, this is my attempt to try to get people to understand a what an argument is, what reason and logic is, and how to actually use it in their daily life. Uh, because it's a waste of time to do anything else other than to create arguments when you're trying to have an intelligent conversation, right? Obviously, if you're trying to have a romantic conversation, express your emotions, right? When you're trying to have a, an intelligent conversation and trying to convince people of something or trying to get something accomplished, please, please have a argument. <laughs> okay, so what is an argument? Argument is a claim or a hypothesis. It's the what, right? It's the what of what you're about to go into. It is a precise and ideally atomic so again, you're not, you're not focusing on, you know, the, the abstract. So you're not saying, okay, government is bad. You're saying this function of government is bad as an example, right? So if it's not atomic, then you guys, you and the person you're communicating with are going to get lost in a bunch of, uh, you know, wasted time trying to figure out what you're actually talking about, right? So make sure you're very precise. You're very atomic and talking about one thing, right? When you're creating an argument. It, uh, it's basically a single point or stance on a matter at hand, right? So, so a matter at hand meaning, you know, whatever you're talking about, right? So a claim is to be tested through the validation of your argument. So the point of an argument is to test uh, claims, in this case, their hypothesis, right? Where we don't have uh, evidence at this point or, you know, we haven't really ana analyzed evidence at this point, uh, but we, we've made a claim, right? And we want to figure out if it's true. And this could be done in, in a cooperative sense or um, what some people call an adversarial sense, which is a debate. Or this can be done, of course, in your own head, right? Um, I like to whiteboard things so you can you know, whiteboard it out and make sure it's true. Um, but there's lots of ways to, to do this, to process through this. Uh, it's great to do it with another person because then you can get their brain thinking too. And then thus you can um, perhaps make insights or understand things that you weren't able or capable of making uh, connections and in information in the past, right? So, so doing it kind of by yourself is not ideal, but certainly you want to do it by yourself so you have a good argument, have a good understanding of what you're talking about, and then you know speak with someone else, right? So, so that way you're not necessarily wasting time. Okay, so then the reason is the why right it's the it's the logic that justifies the claim so so the reason basically goes into and again this is like the reason why this works right it's not you know the reason as in the ability to reason it's the reason why so we're, we're going to take logic some very specific very atomic topic that we're talking about we're going to talk about facts within that particular atomic thing we're talking about that single point we're talking about and then that's going to support the what, right? That's going to support the hypothesis and the claim, what you're trying to get across, right? So, the, so then we get into the uh, evidence, which is the, I guess you could argue, the minute, right, of, of what we're getting into. It's, it's the depths of, hey, okay, I've made this claim now. I've supported it with reason or, or specific logic and, and, you know, I've hinted at evidence or, you know, uh, kind of mentioned evidence in my reason, but now I want to, you know, delve deep into this evidence as to why. And this could be things like, you know, statistics, or it could be things like um, actually testing your reason with the Socratic method or scientific method or, you know, some form of logical or reasonable reason, reasoned method. And, um, and you can get into that, right? So, so if there, if it's a hypothetical in the sense that there is no particular data to support, then you must fall back on, you know, the Socratic method, testing it in the best and worst case scenario, which we'll get into in, in more detail. But this is where it's your opportunity to shine, right? It's an opportunity to showcase what you know about the subject um, or to go back and forth and figure out, you know, what would be the supporting evidence to prove this, et cetera, right? So then the joint is really the, the facts that connect the how and the why and the hypothesis. How do you, how do you connect all this stuff together? The joint is basically encapsulating the bridge between your point and the facts that you've just outlined, 
right? So, so how do they correlate? How do they connect? So again, you know, I, I, as an example, just kind of walking through this, I'll, I'll do one really quickly up to up to kind of point four, is I I start out with the claim or the hypothesis that that basically government taxation is theft, right? So if I were, if that was my hypothesis, it's 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 atomic, right? It's defining the what, it's creating a statement or you know a claim. And then I'm going to get into the reason why. Uh, just real quickly, I'm not going to go the whole argument, but just you know, the quick reason why. So, so if I'm making that statement, the reason then would be because if I were to do the same thing to someone else, like there's three people standing in a room, and I put my hand in the other person's pocket, and I take the money out of their wallet or pocket or whatever, and I give it to the other person, that the person I stole from would recognize that as stealing regardless of whether I gave it to somebody else or not, you know, for whatever purpose or not, it doesn't really matter, right? Maybe, maybe they're starving and I gave it to them. The other person's not going to be happy about that because they would have wanted to be asked first. They would have wanted to make, do the gesture themselves first. So, so the reason is, is that if I were to do that in any other scenario, it would be called theft. Thus, in order for that to be consistent so basically now we have two scenarios where the same action is now functionally treated two different ways so one must be wrong so either it must not be theft to take from someone's pocket or it must be theft to tax right and so so as you go through the supporting evidence and i'm going to go all the details but as you go into the supporting evidence you would figure that out right and then the joint would be okay now that i've proven because I went to a billion people's pockets and I stole from them or something and they all said, no, that sucks. I don't like you or punched you in the face or whatever. Um, then you know it's theft and you're like, okay, well, then taxation cannot be anything moral. It must be theft, right? So you've proven now that the other, the other anomaly is now incorrect, right? So anyway, and then you would join that together. So, so now you're creating that joint between your, your hypothesis and the facts, right? So, okay. So your counterclaim or your null hypothesis at this point is, an, is, is basically the way of removing doubt. It's, the, it's, it's, it's what science relies on. It's what um, philosophers rely on uh, to be able to say, okay, beyond all doubt, we've come up with the potential ethereal, you know, kind of metamorphosis world that this claim could be untrue right that so so now that we've tested through points one through four and we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that this is true we're going to go one step further we're going to say okay what would make it untrue now that we've proven it to be true right and, th and the reason why you do this is because it proves that it you you didn't make a mistake in the moment or you you thought all the way through your problem right this is why no hypothesis exists and so the null hypothesis at this point should be something along the lines of, um, so for taxation would be, okay, well, if people suddenly change their mind and they said, okay, it, I don't care that you took that from my wall, my pocket, then that would prove your original argument wrong. And then thus taxation wouldn't be theft. Like, like so long as people, if everybody started changing their mind and that became the case, or we changed the scenario where humans changed their mind to do that, that would prove uh, us wrong, right? So that's a null hypothesis. And, and, and at this point, generally, I, I jump to null hypothesis here because if you have a good sound argument, that's kind of where it goes, right? Then the, then the other person you're arguing with, there's, there's no place for them to go. They agree with you and you move along to the next topic, right? But at that point at five as well is an opportunity for, uh, for kind of basically, you know, rebuttal or the beginning of rebuttal, um, for people to start to come back with, with counterclaims. I, uh, I generally like to move that into the step six because I think that rebuttal or validation um, should come after your own null hypothesis. You, you shouldn't expect someone else to give you your null hypothesis. You should do it yourself, but oftentimes people don't do that. So uh, my recommendation is to do it first so that you've created a complete argument and then the other person can then respond, right?
Um, but just sometimes five and six blend, uh, I don't like it. I prefer to provide the null hypothesis and then move into rebuttal. So rebuttal is basically, I, I like to call it enlightening the confused because um, at this point, they really have no place to go logically. They have no place to really, you know, provide any other form of conclusion other than what you've outlined unless your evidence was wrong. Right. So if your evidence is wrong, then, of course, there's, um, you know, counterproof or, or new proofs come out. Then you have an opportunity to say, oh, well, I must reapply steps one through five with this new evidence and, you know, see if it still remains true. And then that's where there's an opportunity for true rebuttal. Right. And that's where enlightenment happens. So so either you're being enlightened with new evidence or they're being enlightened because you've proven an argument. Um, so that, that's the basic structure. So this is what everybody needs to follow. And honestly, this shit is simple. I'm not kidding you. You can do this in your, in your sleep. I do this shit on Twitter. So I, you know, I hear this all the time. People arguing, oh, it's 140 characters. Oh no, you're fucking copping out. No, that's not an argument. No, it's not. If you can't do something simple, you don't know what the hell you're talking about, right? If you can explain something in a sentence, you don't know it. Right. So go back and learn, go test it, go sit and go sit down, use your freaking brain, run through this process and come up with an answer and then go talk to people. Right. So it's 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 all excuses. No more excuses, people. <laughs> right. No more excuses. Use this methodology. Talk to everybody. Argue as much as possible. And I mean, argue in an intelligent way, not emotionally. Don't waste people's time. It's a waste of time. Waste of time. Right off my soapbox. <laughs> so methodology. So how do we test in that reasoning phase? What is, what is the methodology um, to test evidence or to test things that we may not have evidence for necessarily? Because, you know, you can certainly test something that, that is logically tr proof uh, proved without necessarily, uh, without it necessarily having to follow the direct scientific method, which is, you know, of course, that it has to be measurable, quantifiable, repeatable um, from, a, from a, a physical properties perspective, right? Um, I, even some theoretical science, right, lives in this world where they use the Socratic method of, of um, best case, worst case, because they may not have the data, but they can, it, it can lead them to where the data may be. Right. So it's a great tool, regardless of whether you have evidence or not, to get into some of these methods to discover data, discover where the data may be sitting, discover where in physics the answer may be. Right. So um, in the Socratic method, it's basically used to determine uh, universal truths, you know, uh, social truths, logical or quanti uh, quantitative truths, um, rational truths. Uh, probably, you know, which is basically, uh, and, and just to give a better distinction of, of rational truth, uh, they're, they're probable, but not yet proven, right? So, so again, when, when I was taught, speaking earlier about kind of what is rational versus logic, rational proofs are things like, well, there's a little bit of ambiguity, but, you know, have past experience has proven X, right? Or it's not conclusive because in some scenarios, you know, one or two anomalies in the, the statistical model um, prefer Y versus X, right? And so, so there's a, you know, in a reason or the, the, the rational arguments, there's this uh, little bit of ambiguity, whereas logical, there's no ambiguity, right? It's always proof. It's, it's always consistent and, um, you know, always testably true. So again, the Socratic method, the, the, the actual method itself, so is, is to basically test a claim in the worst and the best case scenario. And if it remains true, then it must be correct. Thus, it's a fact, right? So again, you can do this in a social uh, sense or in a logical sense or, um, of course, obviously a rational sense. But basically, the methodology is the foundation of science, right? Of course, the Socratic comes from Socrates. There's, I'm not going to do a history lesson here, but um, he really is the, the forefather of science. And there's a lot of people came, you know, after him, but he really defined the first methodology to find truth, right? In, in a very, you know, repeatable, formulatic way. And um, 
And this methodology is the foundation of everything we know to be true, right? This, this is how everything in life is proven true. And science is a, is a subset of the Socratic method, right? So anyway, so the whole point here is that um, use this method for everything you do. Test in the worst case scenario, best case scenario, right? So I'll give a quick example. Um, I, actually, we'll just go back to the example I gave earlier. So um, around taxation. So taxation is theft, right? So if in order to prove in the worst case scenario and the best case scenario, you have to prove that taxation is theft. Uh, say in the worst case scenario would be um, a scenario where say all taxes that are being quote unquote stolen at this point we're testing the theories being taken from someone else are going to support a cause that that individual wants ah, right so now if the individual wants the end cause to happen then is it theft so so that's the worst case scenario for our our theory right for for our yeah for our theory and so in that scenario you've got to prove that that person who wants the outcome to happen is that valid is that valid enough to prove that the method of stealing or the method of taxation is a valid way to achieve that outcome right and it wouldn't be of course because you know who knows you know maybe he wants that outcome to happen maybe he wants to feed the poor or you know whatever the case may be but maybe he doesn't want to happen right now maybe he's trying to pay his bill maybe he has no money and he he doesn't uh you know he he's not able to pay his bills and therefore he isn't able to donate to charity that particular day or that week or maybe his paycheck comes on friday right i mean who knows right you never know until the individual actually does the action whether they want it or not once they've committed to doing the action or if they've done the action then we know for sure that they did want that right otherwise they wouldn't be doing the action they wouldn't be better off so so again you can prove that just using your brain really quickly be even in the worst case scenario where it may be true you can you can start to whittle away at what what it what is really true right and then, and then the best case scenario uh, for your argument. Again, this is best case scenario for your argument, worst case scenario for your argument, not like, you know, happiest or, you know, saddest. It's best or worst for your argument. Um, in the best case scenario for my argument, it's basically what happens today. Taxation gets stolen from everybody, goes into the centralized apparatus, a bunch of fucking sociopaths go and do whatever the hell they want with it. They kill a bunch of people across the planet and then <laughs> and we're all lied to. Right. So, I mean, it's like that's that's the uh, that's the best case scenario for my argument. And it obviously proves true. So, um, and, you know, I'm not getting into the proof points. I'm not making an argument here. I'm just giving an example. But so getting into the scientific method. So the scientific method now basically uses the Socratic method to test things in the worst and best case scenario, but it only applies to physical properties. So in this particular case, to prove something scientifically true, not only does it have to be true in the best and the worst case scenario, so consistently true, immutably, uh, immu always immutably the case, right? It has to have quantifiable uh, properties that exist in the real world or uh, in the case of math can be represented in the real world. So, um, you know, math is a perfect example. So if we were to take a one plus one, right, can we, you know, take a pen and shit, I do have another pen. <laughs> can we take a pen and a pen and in the physical world, is this one plus one? Is this two? Yes, it is. Okay, we've proven via science that this is true, right? So in that particular case, science adds an extra layer. It doesn't necessarily deal with the sociological. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously there's psychology and biology and all these other things which inform, which or just scientific evidence to inform the sociological, but it doesn't necessarily deal with the sociological. So keep that in mind. It deals with physical properties. And it's a great methodology, but it, it's basically the Socratic method, just with a little bit more rigor, just applied to physical properties, right? Statistics. Statistics are a great tool, obviously. Um, 
they, you know, <laughs> they oftentimes can be bullshit. Uh, so you got to be really careful with statistics. There is an entire science and you can spend eight or more years in college, which is a waste of time, by the way, uh, learning statistical methods and um, quantifiable sample groups and all these other things that basically help you take a small population, you know, which is your sample group and extrapolate what would happen in a larger population, right? Based on statistical probabilities and all these mathematical formulas that we've 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 built our foundation of statistics on over time. Models and you know you can add in millions of variables at some point to try to build these statistical models. It's a lot of what you know in the market marketing becomes trying to understand how to drive awareness and drive behavior and all this other stuff. Um, so it's it's really fascinating. Don't get me wrong. I, I think statistics are amazing but just be careful. Most of them are generally full of shit. So take hard statistics, take things that are um, easily quantifiable to build your foundations on. If you're dealing in a realm where you need statistics that are hard to come by, that are hard to for you to prove the methodology by which those statistics were built, or, or if you're building statistical models yourself, um, be very cautious, be very thorough distill it down to the atomic level one of the biggest problems we run into with statistical models these days and even though it's there like statistics 101 you're measuring a unit you're measuring a thing you're not measuring you know life's existence and uh, what's the meaning of life right you're measuring you know what one little thing People fuck that up all day long, right? They they will they will add in all sorts of complexity to their models. You can't do it. It's it's unprovable. It's a waste of time. It's not even worth examining, right? So take very specific pieces of statistics. If they have more than one topic in this statistic and more than one proof, one more than one thing to prove, they're completely bullshit. So throw them out immediately and then move on to some other pieces of data that are focused on one thing. And then you can start to combine them at some point. But again, this requires your due diligence to make sure that they were combined right or, you, you know, you trust the source implicitly, which is very rare and hard to do. So just be really cautious about someone else's interpretation of the data. Right. But it is a great tool um, and it helps in, you know, the Socratic method in testing sociological things for sure. Uh, when you've when you've had like tons of tests and studies that all say the same thing, and I'll give you an example. So child abuse, so spanking your child, being you know raising your voice at your child, uh, being mean to your child, all these other things um, have been proven uh, very intensely over the course of I'd say the last sixty years through a multitude of studies, through meta studies, through all these other things. And so we can we can pretty well conclude that, you know, based on this massive body of knowledge that uh, being a dick to your child is not a good thing. Right. <laughs> and and so so there's lots of there's lots of things that you can say, OK, well, we've known this for a very long time. OK, I can feel comfortable in the, the statistical models behind this. So so feel free to use it. It's definitely a great tool. Um, just it's not the end all be all. And make sure you test it, obviously, with a Socratic or scientific method where possible right um so uh, kind of bring us this clo uh, towards the 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 ending the closing topics are a lot of people don't understand the difference between an opinion and a fact and believe me i wake up and i question why i have to say this at all but you know whatever it is the current state of human beings and their understanding of knowledge and uh you know that's why we're here having these conversations right we wouldn't be having these conversations if everyone had 160 IQ and uh, spent 90% of their day studying this shit, right? So if they don't, they have other concerns, I get it. Um, but, uh, but you know, some of these basic tools everyone can, can use from a grandma to, you know, the brightest scholar on the planet, right? So, so someone at the end of the life, someone at the, at, you know, kind of reaching the, the excellence of their life and the peak of their, their career and their, their brain power, uh, there's no reason why you can't all be using these methodologies to have intelligent arguments. So opinion versus fact. Facts are universal and constant. They are not universal and sometimes true. <laughs> 
<laughs> they are true across the entire sample group. So all humans on the planet, by example of, of a sociological uh, proof, would be all humans would constantly through, you know, cradle to grave, or at least, you know, perhaps you could even demark it and say adulthood to end of life or dementia or whatever, believe these things, right? So you can whittle things down, of course, right, into sub-segments, uh, even, you know, 30-somethings, you know, 20-somethings, whatever, if you wanted to. But the whole point is, is that in order for something to be a fact, it must be universal and constant. Always true. Always true, right? Okay. So, again, in this case, you can use the, the term or the, the methodology of it's always universal and constant, preferable human behavior to what do we always harp on? Not want initiation of force used against you, right? So let me run through that again. So as an example, the only one thing we know about all humans is that not one human wants force to be used against them. They're, they may be okay with it being used against, you know, them using it against other people, but then of course they're, they're ignoring logic right because because again they're basically saying i don't want it to happen to me but if it's if it's universal and constant principle so if they if it's good for the goose it's good for the gander right if it's universal and constant then they're violating their own logic by using violence against someone else right so this is the basis of upb universally preferable behavior from stefan mon you can go you know i'll link to the video you can watch that but but the whole point is is that um this is the only thing we know about humans today right sociologically that we can always prove and it's always universal and uh it's it's basically immutable right so so anyway there's very few things that fall into the preference category of human behavior that we know is true right that we know is fact thus what does that mean Lots of shit is an opinion. Most everything is an opinion. Like, your choice not to do drugs is not someone else's choice. Your choice not to do a prostitute is not someone else's choice. Your choice in spouse, in career, in friends, not someone else's choice, right? Not universal, not cons constant, not your damn business, right? So the whole point is that most things are opinion. Most things are opinion. Very few facts when you're dealing with human beings, right? So that leads you to a certain conclusion, which anarcho-capitalist kind of libertarians get. Well, you know, don't mean to be dogmatic about this. this is really about arguments. But the whole point is, is once you figure this out, everything else is simple, right? So again, uh, the the whole point is that most things are opinion. Very few things are fact when you're dealing with human beings, individuals. They they have this hierarchy, of course, which you know Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, so at any one given time, what they used to say was their priority can change instantaneously. The only thing we know is true that they don't want force used against them. Right. So very few things are actually provable when it comes to human preferences. So just keep that in mind. Right. Lots of shit's opinion. Don't waste your time on opinion. Let them let them have their opinion, their preference, their choice. And don't use violence against them for it, right? Okay. So how do we risk mitigate unknowns? So the, the key thing here to understand about reasoning versus logic is that reasoning is a way of saying, of applying this knowledge that you've gained over time. Some, you know, like I mentioned before, some people call it a hunch or an intuition or things of that nature or things that just are somewhat proven, but not 100% proven, right? It's a risk mitigation tactic. So reason is basically the ability to take it, the amount of evidence you may have at any one given time and create a least risky answer and then thus a course of action, right? So the biggest problem with logic is that not everything can be solved uh, immediately, right? And I use the word immediately because at infinitum, so long as humans still exist at infinitum, anything can be solved, right? But 
you know, we're not all, we're not there yet, right? Science is still figuring everything out. There's lots of things we don't understand, right? Uh, scientifically, there's lots of things sociologically that most people don't understand, even if we already know it's true, like the non-aggression principle, right? So there's, there's lots of things also that just fall into opinion. Yeah, it's just, just as the matter of fact of, of individuals being so unique, right? That's the beauty of, of human beings. And then, so how do we deal with this ambiguity? This is reason, right? This is the difference between reason and logic. This is why we still have reason. Reason is, so the best methodology of using reason, so, so if I were to encapsulate reason now into a methodology, there's two layers. There's the individual over all else. So again, in order for reason to function, reason comes from you, the individual, your reasoning, you're using your brain. It's, methodology is a universal tool that we can all use to come to the same or same conclusions. But you're the paramount, right? You're the most important thing in the equation. So your opinions and your preferences are superior to everyone else's in the sense of, you know, your own choices, your own actions that don't require someone else, right? Then you have to negotiate afterwards, after that. So, so if you, if, if it's all within your purview, if it's all within your means and ability, then whatever you prefer is your choice. So long as, you, of course, you don't initiate force, right? That's, that's now interacting with someone else. And now in order to interact with someone else, you have to provide value. Right. That's when we start to get into these sociological conversations. But otherwise, everything else is reserved for you, the individual. You are the most important thing in the world. Right. And and we talk about proof points behind this. I actually have a whole mathematical thing behind this that I'm going to do in another show. But the, the whole point is, this: if if you're in that ambiguity world where you're not sure you don't maybe don't quite have all the evidence, start with the individual over all other concerns. Start there. That's going to prove your, prove, prove out the truth 99% of the time. My example is global warming. Let's assume it's true, right? Um, if the cure is worse than, than the, than the disease, right? So like, like if, if eliminating fossil fuels, let's just say that they're the cause of global warming as well. Let's, let's say that it's global warming. It's anthropogenic and uh, so human caused. And it's fossil fuels, those fucking damn dinosaurs, right? So uh, let's just assume that's all true. And now we're saying, okay, eliminate fossil fuels. What happens? Probably most people on the planet die. At least 3 billion people die, like in almost instantaneously, right? Why? Because we have no way. That's our best method for energy production. There's not. There's not any others that are that are surpass that. So is it reasonable? Even if it's true, right? Let's just say that's that's. We're just going to throw out all sanity now. We're going to say that's completely true, and somehow we've proven it beyond a shadow of a doubt. Well, what do we do? Well, we. We can't go around just killing all the individuals because, you know, they no longer have access to, to clean, well, not to clean, but to, to dirty, uh, efficient energy, right? <laughs> that's insane. That's, that's, that's aggressing against someone else, right? So, so the whole point is, is that you can, reason helps us take, even if something's completely true, like the non-aggression principle and enable us to do something tactically or pragmatically in the moment that may even be counter to the truth, especially sociologically, right? And the reason why is because there's a cost or a bigger risk to, you know, uh, doing the, the fundamental thing versus the tactical thing or pragmatic thing, right? So just keep that in mind. The individual supersedes all other concerns. Because the individual is equal in weight mathematically. It's, just, it's an integer, right? It's a whole number, one. one. <laughs> and uh, if you divide it, it loses its essence, right? That's the basic principle or behind the mathematical form behind an individual and why it's more important or why it's equally important to the sum of all individuals. Because without that, the collective has no, no value. So, so if you were to say that, you know, integer one, Mraz, is not equal to everyone else, 
on the planet, then you would then everyone else on the planet would have no value because it, we, we would strip the essence of that integer one. Right. So anyway, so it, the, it's the proof that proves the opposite completely untrue. Right. OK, so pragmatic over perfect. Pragmatic over perfect is, again, going into these scenarios where we don't have the perfect answer. Um, so basically, if something reduces violence um, without creating more violence in and of itself, as an example, if I go vote for an individual, say like, you know, Gary Johnson or whatever, who the fuck knows what he's going to do? He's an individual. He might follow incentives when he's in the government or disincentives to completely continue to move them, move the machine the way it's been moving and still violently churn through people. But if I were to vote for a bill that were to take away a right from the government, such as a um, maybe a ballot measure or whatever that said, OK, this law now is being dissolved and no longer exists, then we know that's a net you know, that's that's a net value. That's a net gain. It's going to reduce the amount of violence in the world, in the government, etc. Uh, so that's that's like the, the difference between so that's a reasoned explanation. And that's the difference between doing something that's pragmatic, but not violent. Again, you know, I would never vote for an individual because who knows what they'll do. There's maybe some exceptions there for Adam Kokesh and, and that's a whole another reason because he has very specific ballot measures right there are very specific things he's going to do um but and anyway that's a whole nother series <laughs> but the whole point is is that I wouldn't vote for like a Trump versus Clinton or a um even a Ron Paul who I admire greatly um over someone else because I don't know what they're going to do they're an individual they can do whatever the hell they want and there's no even even your entire past experience is not going to prove who you are going to be in the future it gives you a hint and when we're dealing with something so grave as violence and so grave as a centralized violence apparatus like government it's not worth the risk of voting right the only thing i would ever potentially like i said theoretically uh endorse so to speak or or do myself would be to vote for a ballot measure that would eliminate something like, like for example in montana it's illegal to sell raw milk fucking retarded right it's a it's a whole barrier to entry thing so that you know individual farmers can't get in the marketplace easily blah blah because blah. they have to buy all these equipment and things to pasteurize and it just creates this big barrier to entry by having this law that all the other farmers who already have their fucking farm and already have all this stuff set up are totally behind because they know that they don't have any more competition uh fucking dicks all right so anyway the whole point is is that it, when you look at when you look at this that that type of bill it says okay i'm eliminating that violence now very specific very atomic very functional now that thing is gone right so in those scenarios maybe it makes sense right again it's your choice you've got to make that that calculation is that particular participation with the government going to give it more validity by buying into the voting process to remove this one law versus just completely ignoring it altogether right so anyway hopefully these examples and these concepts have have made made sense and hopefully uh, people have a good understanding of, of basically how to actually create an argument now now the best thing for you to do is go apply it go test it go test your skills so um the best thing you can do actually is go post an argument right here beneath this video and um i'll respond to it and we'll go back and forth and i'll help you te test your own methodology um hopefully i'll i'll give you some some good information some good facts some good arguments or hopefully someone else in the audience will uh, right here is the best place to test it. The second best place is to uh, post an argument on my Twitter, uh, the show's Twitter, uh, at FS underscore DAO. Links are in the thing. Um, and again, I love Twitter. I think it's a great, well, I love Twitter, at least from its design, as far as, you know, its, its restrictions on characters, because it forces you to actually use your brain and come up with a simple answer for each one of your responses and of course you can post you know like uh post one two three four blah 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 as many as you need if you really do need to delve deeper into things or add more facts or evidence or whatever but i also like 
long tail, long form arguments. You want to make an argument around uh, that's really detailed and in depth. I love that as well. Again, you can post in the comments. You can send me a Twitter. If you uh, connect with me on Twitter, uh, I'll, I'll, you know, I, I, I collaborate with anybody over direct message. I'm fine with that. Emails, whatever. So um, anyway, you want to collaborate. I'm I'm open to that channel. Right. So um, the and the, the the other best methodology is we actually have a call-in show. We're going to start having some of these call-in shows uh, uh, actually show up on the on the on the channel. <laughs> so, uh, but feel free to send me an email, shoot me a message on Twitter, send a comment on the video. Just say, hey, I want to uh, be on the show. I want to have an argument. You know, I want to have an argument. I want to lay out an argument and, and debate with you, or or just present your argument. Um, as well, if you want to just present your argument, I'm more than willing to just have people have their voices heard without uh, counter arguments. That's that's your choice. So um, feel free to let me know if you want to be on the show. We just generally do things over Google Hangouts or Skype or whatever. It's really easy. Um, you know, there's no special tools or no big process to get in on the show. It's it's really easy. Um, the other place that I found very useful is uh, Stefan Mullen use Free Domain Radio, their message boards, boards.freedomainradio.com. Uh, lots of pretty smart people there, and generally they try to focus on creating arguments and not uh, bias and emotion and all this other wasted time wasters, right? It was really what they are. Uh, anything that's not an argument is really just a waste of time. So um, so feel free to head over there. They, they're, they're a great place to apply your skills, test your skills. Um, hone your skills and, and to see other people's uh, talent out there and ideas. The other thing that I love to do is to test this stuff with my family, my friends, my colleagues. Uh, believe me, I've been the thorn in the side of every person I've ever worked with because I argue all day long. I, <laughs> you know, whatever. It's just, just who I am. Um, and they've come to know that and deal with that. But the uh, but I love arguing with colleagues as well. Um in your day job, so to speak, or my day job, as an example, and it's a great, it's a great way to apply it as well. Like I've applied argumentative methodologies in meetings with, you know, obviously executives or with my peers, um, you know, at the time, during, like technologist peers at the time when I was doing, uh, you know, kind of lower level development, and 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 have built code. Code, you know, has arguments in it to a certain degree, and more programmatic, very logical, etc. But but again, this all this stuff is a great place to test arguments. It's a great way to hone your skills. Um, the other thing I like to do is I actually like to test argumentative formula, my, you know, the, the six step argument formula with people that I, I, I just met, right? Just kind of a fresh brain, so to speak. And um, so long as I have enough time to kind of get through an argument, you know, obviously if I'm buying a fucking coffee or something I'm not gonna sit there and have an argument with the the barista right but uh, but if I you know meet someone I'm talking to them and I have more than you know uh, five ten minutes I'll, I'll you know I'll bring up an argument I'll, I want to want to see where their thought processes are I want to see how they respond and believe me it will tell you more about that person than <laughs> than 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 years of, of of a relationship friends dating whatever right if you just start you know within the first few minutes of getting to know someone an argument and again I'm, I'm not talking about where people brainwash the term argument into meaning something um rude or or violent or whatever right or abusive it's it's not that an argument is a logical flow of orderly thought right and that's so so if you do that with someone you can tell whether they're smart or whether they use logic or they've they they understand this methodology, and you can understand you can get into something meaningful, you know that that you can learn about that person. So um, it's one of my favorite things to do. I highly recommend you do it, and believe me, your life will improve when you do it. You'll find better quality people. So so uh, again, this show is a hundred percent funded by people like you. You got, there's there's no other means of funding the show. Um, I won't take advertising like you said in the past. I'm completely at your mercy. If you like what I'm doing, uh, please, please donate to the show. It, it'll it give me the opportunity to, to, to spend all of my time doing this, uh, which is really what I want to do. I want to focus on the show and building the software. Um, and you guys are the ones that are going to help fuel that. So as, as donations come in, I do more as uh, if there's no donations or whatever, if they don't come in, then, you know, 
no show, no content, no development, right? So, I mean, you guys are going to drive the milestones. You guys are going to drive the show. So if you like what I'm doing, you uh, like where, you know, where we're going to go with the software and all this other stuff, please donate and uh, prove, prove our model, right? Thank you so much.